So uh, I guess it's time to start. Yep. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Monet Working Group meeting. Um, this is the novel. Um, if this is not your first meeting, or if it is your first meeting and it's not the first session of this week, then you will have seen this. If not, uh, take good care of all the important uh, do's and don'ts uh, listed uh, on this sheet. They are important. Here are a couple of uh, online meeting tips that are a part of the standard slide set and that um, I should have followed myself. So more information. And now we get to the actual working group specific slides. Um, my co-chair is Don Fedick. I'm Ron Infeld. Our responsible AED is Alvaro. Hi, Alvaro. And Don is our brand new co chair. Um, but he's not new to the IETF at all. And he's also uh, an active uh, participant in the IEEE, I believe, in the 802.1 group. But uh, maybe you, uh, you want to give a short introduction yourself. Uh, yeah, sure. I've been uh, in the IETF for many years and also in the IEEE. I've spent quite a bit of time in 802.1 and lately in the security area. And in the IETF, I've been doing some uh, work in DETnet and uh, IPSECME. Okay. Yeah. I don't hear you, Ron. Ah. Sorry. Why does it do that? It asks for permission to use my microphone again. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Good. So, uh, we go through some, uh, through some document status, and then the bigger part of this uh, session is devoted to uh, future work. I have some ideas uh, on the slide on things that we could work on. Uh, most of them are actually covered by our charter, but have been neglected for the last uh, two years, three years maybe. And uh, I just want to see if there's interest in energy in the working group to to pick up some of these items at least and uh, we'll take it from there but first um oh by the way i should have asked if anybody is willing to take some notes in Kodi MT. um if not, then I'll do the same thing that I did last time, and that, that is uh, um, look at the recording and uh, make the minutes from there. But if you can make some, some notes, uh, however sketchy, uh, that, uh, that's already helpful. I should have asked in the mailing list, sorry, didn't get around to that. So, uh, to the documents, we have three working group documents that have been um, in working group law school for longer than I care to remember. I think it was our previous chair, Justin Dean, who uh, actually put them in, uh, in working group law school, but now uh, we, uh, they're finally completed, and they are completed because uh, at least one person generated some comments on these drafts, and that person was me, unfortunately. 
Um, um, as we speak, uh, one of the authors, Lou Berger, is producing updates uh, of these uh, of these uh, internet drafts to iron out the last niche that uh, were found. And oh, as was already uh, indicated by Alvaro uh, during last meeting, the next step for these documents will be to send them to the uh, Transport Area Directorate for some, some early review. And then they will uh, proceed uh, through all the steps that come after the working group uh, has, uh, has lost all these, uh, these documents. So they should be finally be on their way to become uh, RFCs. We have another document from the same author set which uh, was somewhat left behind for, for no good reason, actually. Uh, it, it really belongs to the, the same set as the three uh, drafts discussed above. And um, I have initiated a, a final adoption call for this thing uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it ended last Saturday. Uh, there was some comment from uh, Henning Robert, who is unfortunately not here tonight, as far as I can see. Um, but he called uh, actually the whole uh, approach in question of the splitting of the documents. The, these uh, flow control related uh, drafts started out as a single. Um, internet draft, and then after some discussion in the working group uh, a long time ago, it was decided to split them uh, for reasons that seemed uh, very valid at the time. And uh, with these documents having been in working group last call for so long, uh, it seems a bit, uh, well, it's impossible to go back on that uh, now. So, um, I've noted the comments on uh, the DLAB Ether credit extension uh, as made by uh, Henning Rogge on the mailing list, but uh, I think that uh, it's too late to change the approach now, and uh, I consider this work, this uh, internet draft as adopted, unless uh, there's now a massive protest. So I would like to hear that. Nobody in the queue. Um, and then we have um, three more documents that were uh, written or uh, submitted just before the last meeting and that are still awaiting comments. I'll come back to those uh, later. Um, But actually, I would like now to switch to a different set of slides and uh, give the floor to Loberger. All right, thank you. Um, so I put these together before I knew what the, um, before I saw the updated agenda. So uh, I'll defer to the chairs if they want me to go at a different rate or cover ma different material. They've seen the slide deck. Um, so I'm gonna do something odd. Uh, the chairs should feel free to flip to the next slide or flip to whatever slide they'd like me to talk about. Um, just because things got reorganized a little bit. So, um, Take me where you want me to talk. <laughs> um, I suggest you just just go through them. Sure. Uh, then next. So I'm talking about uh, I'm talking through um, several documents. We heard Ronald uh, give the the status on them. While my name is on the slide deck, 
uh, each of these documents do have co-authors uh, co who are um, not in attendance for various reasons. Uh, um, as uh, Ronald said, the first three were wrapping up, uh, right, wrapping up last call. I've been a little slow on getting the updates out. I wanted them last week. Uh, but I said I, I would get them before this meeting, and I succeeded. Uh, so the, the uh, responses are there, and I've updated the documents. Uh, I, I, I pushed the publication request on all of them. One of them requires um, secretariat processing, sent off a request for that. Uh, you know, document numbers are cheap, so if someone doesn't like the changes or wants different changes, um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly rev the documents again. Um, we've been through the adoption calls on the uh, Ether credit and um, chairs. I've heard just now that these, this is adopted. Do you want me to just um, uh, immediately resubmit with draft IETF? Um, if you could uh, take a look at the, uh, the comments that I provided also for this uh, document, uh, maybe you have that done it already in the last hour or so it wasn't following uh, but, I didn't uh, see when I, I didn't notice your comments so I apologize for missing that actually a couple of your messages got filtered uh, including the last one that I just responded to which you had sent privately um, uh, and um, uh, I just I found the one of them but obviously not this one I'll tell you that I did make changes to parallel the DA credit extension. So if it's just the same comments I've already made that you did on DA credit, I've already made those, even though I didn't see those comments. So I'll take a look and, and do an update. Um, yeah, um, do you want me to I, do the update first? If you want me, I, I can either publish what was uh, went through the adoption call as the zero zero, or make the fixes and then publish that as zero zero. Your call. Um. I would you prefer, I would prefer you to uh, make the fixes first and then uh, issue it as a uh, working group document. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, and if you if you if you have lost them, then uh, I can send them again. But I I seem to remember that I saw I sent uh, my comments on the same day as the traffic classification and. Uh, I, I just know that somehow it's filtering. I just it, it, it probably I, I'm sure I have it. I will reach out to you if I don't. And otherwise, they are in the uh, mailing list archive. Yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'll I'll have a um, updated rev of the draft burger done before the end of this meeting. How's that? Assuming that other agenda wow. items. That, that, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, questions from the list. I was hoping uh, Henning would be here so we could talk through them. Um, the one of them is uh, um, why have extensions no data items, Ronald? I think you covered that well. We had a long history. Um, I have a slide on it if we want to recap it in more depth, but I think you covered that well. And why use TID versus LID? Um, some of it is historical because LID was not present at the time we did TID originally. Um, the other thing is uh, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't think we want to require LID all the time just to use these new extensions. Uh, and uh, on list, I mentioned that if we were to follow through with Henning's proposal, we would have to um, respin that RFC and um, you know basically hit reset on these documents. So I, yeah. I, I think um, uh, even if we accepted LID, it, it's a major process piece. But also from the technical standpoint, I disagree that it's the right solution. I see Rick Taylor in here. Yeah, Rick is in the queue. So go ahead, Rick. Um, I, hi, everybody. I agree with Lou. Um, I can see Henning's point of why do we need another discriminator that we have to handle in our implementations. But from my perspective, a lid is a very specific identifier to say that there are uh, multiple layer three addressable uh, destinations beyond the MAC address you are using currently to identify and a TID means something else and uh, just reusing the identifier to mean two different things I think gets immediately confusing and becomes context sensitive and then how do I perform an impl implementation which supports um, multiple TIDs per lid 
for example. So I, I, yes, they're both just integer identifiers, but let's not mash them together because they're the same data type. I think that's the wrong approach. Yeah, another potential problem that I see, and that this may pop up if we have any further uh, DLL extensions, is that you create uh, an interdependency between extensions. So you, yeah, you, you could very only use. So, so uh, by force by forcing someone to implement lid just uh, just to support uh, traffic classification, I think is a mistake. Yes. But what if your modem says that it supports uh, TIT or, or uh, credit extensions, but not uh, link identifiers? I'm I'm in agreement. Yeah, I, I, I from from a from a programming perspective, from an implementation perspective, I can see Henning's point, but I think conceptually it's a mistake to do it. Okay. So. Uh, He's not here to uh, to raise the point, but uh, uh, again, but uh, I will uh, confirm on the mailing list that we consider this uh, this thing um, uh, a work group document now, and um, I think we can working group last call. It's it's very soon, but there is some room to for further uh, discussion within the work group. It's only been adopted as a working group uh, document. It's not working group last call yet, so there is still uh, a window for for making further comments for this one. However, I would like to send it uh, uh, running after the other documents uh, uh, pretty soon, and I think that uh, Lou will uh, only be happy about that. So, Lou, do you want to continue with your presentation? Uh, your call. Uh, as I said, you you were the driving the slide, so I will follow you. Oh, uh, yeah. But I appreciate it, and uh, of course, my comments were sent to the list. So, if Henning wants to take the discussion up there, we can take it up uh, further. Okay. Um, yeah, I think you've already covered these items. I'll just point out that there is a uh, somewhat uh, old implementation available on uh, GitHub. And if you are interested, please uh, look at it. I think actually there's room for someone to take over uh, driving that just because I know that there's been pull requests on it for a while. Um, not sure if there's anyone in the, in the group who's interested, but I figured I'd put out that public service announcement. So, uh, uh, say, say, that, say that again, please. I missed that. Uh, uh, I shouldn't have uh, give go back two slides. I'm just mentioning that that um, that uh, uh, GitHub uh, DLAP um, implementation with, from Lincoln Labs has had pull requests against it for a little while, and there might be an opportunity for someone to take over supporting that implementation or fork it into another repo and, and you know, give it a little more TLC, uh, tender loving care, uh, uh, yeah. you know, so a little more attention. And I figured I'd mention that because, you know, people in this room or listening to this recording are the ones who are likely to be the ones to take it on. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know what the plans are from the group that put that out. I'm just comment, I just observed that there's the pull requests that have been sitting there for a while. Uh, it looks like Rick um, wants to respond to that. Last, last time I looked, oh, yeah, go ahead, Rick. Uh, so, yeah, some of the pull requests actually came from my team. So uh, what we've done in the meantime is we have a fork of that also on GitHub, which I will uh, find the URL in the chat. There's, it's, it's a clone with the, uh, with the pull requests merged together. Um, which we've been using extensively. I also support if somebody wants to take it on because, you know, my team doesn't have the, the bandwidth to do this at the moment. Um, it would be great if this was adopted by the community. So anyone listening who wants to pull all this together, that's great. Um, I'm just saying this. <laughs> Those pull requests are valid and there, there are some bug fixes. It needs a bit of TLC, really. Good to know. Uh, with my chair hat off, I'm interested. I want to get this working again with uh, against um, against email. It it is 
being used quite heavily by uh, several people in a large European consortium. So we, you know, we ah. recommend it to various people. So it, it is getting proper use. It's it's for test beds and interrupt testing. It's it's a really useful tool, and it would be a pity if it if it rusted away. Okay. If you can provide the link, then that would be excellent. Yeah, I'd suggest putting it on the list unless the chairs think otherwise. Put it on the list. Great. Um, this is the history on how things got broke, a little bit upon how they broke got broken apart and when this actually was based on discussion at um, IETF um, 101 and 102. Uh, if you do the math, that's a long time ago. Um, and basically, we started out with one document, then went to two documents, and then ended up in four. And the, the thought is that um, we can take a building block approach in the base documents and then the negotiate which of the building blocks we're using and how we're combining them using the, the credit extensions. So the, I'm sorry, the extensions. So the extensions say how to combine the base um, uh, uh, data items or the base objects and um, and it allows it allows you to avoid exactly the problem that I can't remember Ronald or either you brought up um, or Rick brought up is is where you have to implement um, part of a specification that you don't really care about yeah, um, yeah. because it's 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 derivative and you know that was the reason at the time uh, I, I I'm going to give Rick Rick credit for being the strong advocate for this it may not have been uh, my memory may, may be foggy but it actually resonates with me and I think it is a good approach. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, as I said, you, you go your speed. Yeah. Uh, tell me what you'd like me to talk about. Do you want to, you had asked uh, something privately you on the difference between, uh, what is it, uh, TID and FID. Uh, would you like to jump right there? Um. No, I, I thought that people might be confused about that, but... Uh, okay, um, so, you know, the, uh, we have two, um, uh, we, we have two different types of extensions for flow control. One of them is using a link-based mechanism, the pause extension. Um, that's really sort of like X on, X off, and uh, it is, um, uh, it's really very coarse because you can either pause on the link basis or on a priority basis, but not on a destination basis. And there's certainly some um, uh, uh, channels out there where you might want to pause to one endpoint, but not the other. And that's what we get with the credit flow control. Um, and uh, the credit flow control also is a, a method of uh, it, it's it's sort of a window-based approach. So rather than X on, X off, you, you can uh, get credits. Um, the I like to characterize one as work conserving and one not as work conserving and non-work conserving, but that might, that's a little coarse in, in that I think with the um, credit extension, you can actually keep the link a little busier than you could with the pause. Um, but mm -hmm. that depends a little bit on the time windows yeah, and the implementations. Um, on your queue size on, on the router side, probably. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, great. Did you yeah. skip one? Yeah, there's a nasty window over my slide thing. I think it's pretty funny uh, that that yeah. been, uh, okay. Uh, uh, back to, please. All right, so the basic operation is that the um, credit windows and the traffic identif identification pieces are given in the session. Um, the, uh, the difference, you'll notice there's a term here, flow identifier and traffic class identifier. And the differences is one is about the treatment and really about queue management, and that's the flow identifier. And the other one is about traffic classification and that's the traffic classification identifier. Um, and what do I mean by classification is, is what fields in the header do you use to um, map traffic to the particular queuing treatment? So really that's the difference between TID and FID. Hopefully that's clear, if it's not, come to the queue. 
um, uh, and we support um, the um, mapping a uh, a flow to a particular um, uh, traffic class. So for you can do cl traffic classification on that. Okay, next. Um, if you run out of credits, we have some uh, ability to request credits and also give credits. And this reviews the messages that are used for it. Um, I copied and pasted this from an old presentation. In the bottom left, it actually is a mistake. I didn't update. So you can actually see when this slide was originally presented. Uh, okay. Or, well. mo or <laughs> maybe most recently presented. So again, for, uh, for the nitty gritty details, see the documents. Uh, okay, I'm going to uh, switch to uh, the next presentation, if you don't mind. Uh, not at all. Thank you for the time and um, uh, comments, and also uh, moving this forward. Yeah. Implicitly, we have covered uh, item three on the agenda. Uh, I already talked about that. We uh, that we uh, consider this uh, the the ether-based uh, approach uh, as a working group document now, and uh, nobody was rushing to to the microphone to. Uh, to protest, so uh, uh, I'll just confirm this on the on the mailing list, and we uh, we proceed as agreed. I have one slide um, on Henning Roberts' uh, three um, drafts that are all uh, physical layer related. Um, I am in the process of reviewing them. I have provided comments on the one about general utilization. Uh, what Henning does is actually define four new data items. Uh, and the uh, draft currently does not state in which messages uh, these uh, data uh, items are to be used. But uh, what I was really wondering about is why he does not let the modem calculate uh, the channel utilization instead of sending these uh, uh, individual parameters to the router and, uh, and let the, the router uh, sort it out. Uh, well, ah, Rick knows the answer to that one. Go ahead. Wait, no, I don't, but I agree with your question. Um, so. I know Stan and, and the team's original idea with DLEP was that the modem should give the router information that the router understands. And my concern with these three uh, extensions is they're really uh, telling the router about layer one, layer two, or layer one information, really, that in terms that maybe don't make sense at layer three. Now, the counter argument from Henning has always been, yes, but you could be doing some very clever calculation uh, within your router or some AI that's doing some predictive stuff or, or all kinds of exciting modern techniques. So just getting the information is useful. But I agree that it I, I would prefer to see slightly more condensed information or perhaps have all of this as one extension and say, look, here's a load of radio layer channel information that, that the modem can can hand out. But I share your concerns, Ronald. OK, good. Um, maybe you can uh, uh, say something like that on the mailing list. I know that I'll you say, have commented. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. <laughs> yeah, I know that you've commented uh, three months ago uh, when they were initially uh, submitted. But uh, it, it can't hurt to, uh, to repeat uh, that. Actually, I think the radio band one is is uh, is, uh, is is almost ready for for group adoption. Uh, I can see a use for that, but I will uh, I will uh, say why on the mailing list. The radio quality one, I haven't really taken a, a long hard look uh, at it. Uh, it provides or can provide. Uh, several kinds of information, signal to noise ratio, uh, radio signal strength indicator. And uh, again, yeah, there I share uh, 
So the idea is that Rick was just expressing that uh, this is maybe too low level information for uh, for the router. But uh, yeah. Lou, Lou, do you have a comment? I'm going to say something similar uh, where it, it, it's just a, it, it applies to all of these. Um, in anticipation of this discussion, I went, went and reviewed all of them. And they look interesting, but none of them have, uh, you call it on this first one, motivation. So you know, what is the router supposed to do with this? And mm -hmm. if it, you know, take it and pass it to some magic, you know, AI thing, uh, I, you know, I think that was what Rick said. Sure, that's fine, but it, it should say it. And I think without that, uh, I, I'm not sure it makes sense to adopt these. Um, now that said, I think these are really interesting and I'd like to learn how we should be using them. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's just a matter of uh, uh, providing some more text in the introduction to, uh, to motivate uh, why they are there. Uh, and I remember that uh, the link identifier uh, uh, draft in its first incarnation was also very terse and uh, that got uh, fixed later. So it is possible, I guess. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Mm, okay, I think we are almost on time. Uh, okay. This is uh, hopefully the most uh, interactive part of uh, this session. Um, I'm just going to throw out some ideas and if you uh, uh, think they're good or bad or uh, you're, uh, you're interested to work on them, uh, I would like to hear that because it will uh, uh, determine where we go. Um, I took a look at the uh, current charter. I think we have had this charter since 2016. So long before uh, I became a, a chair. Um, the parts in green, I think, are covered. We have done uh, almost nothing but DLAP work in the last few years. Um, just after the recharter, uh, multicast uh, seemed to have a lot of interest. And I uh, will quickly go to an old presentation by Justin Dean uh, in a minute. Um, and then we have uh, a charter item on uh, a document that we were supposed to produce on outlining challenges and best practices for deploying and managing MANE networks. I'll come back to that. And at the same time, we still have uh, a role in uh, maintaining uh, OSR V2 and, uh, and friends and extensions. And another thing I noticed is that we have a, a couple of uh, experimental uh, documents, RFCs, that may or may not uh, become standard Rex document uh, at some time. I know Henning has done a lot of work on the uh, directional airtime metric. He is uh, the original author. Uh, over the, the last few years, uh, I think we have gained uh, <clears throat> quite some experience with, uh, with that metric. And I wonder, uh, it's, it's uh, again a pity that he is not here, but I wonder if uh, he, for instance, would be interested uh, to take this to, uh, to standard spec or anybody else, uh, of course. And um, there's, the a, multi there's a question on the chat window. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not seeing it at the moment, but uh, yes, please. Uh, the question is, do we have any feedback from the chairs on the latest OLSR2 uh, 
OLSR V2 queries seen on the list? Uh, actually, that's in my next slide. Um, yeah, let's go to that. Um, this chair, at least, uh, still has to wrap his head around the problem because uh, I'm not that deep into the details of OLS RV2, but uh, there is in the, indeed, it, I was uh, sort of present when, when Henning uh, Robert discovered this. I was part of the same event where this, uh, this uh, emerged. Um, and there we were uh, in, a, in an OSR version 2 uh, network, uh, restarting uh, routers uh, very frequently and sometimes they didn't find each other again. They were no, not, no longer able to uh, accept each other's uh, topology control messages. And this had to do with uh, um, receiving routers uh, thinking that uh, advertised uh, neighbor sequence numbers uh, were, uh, were stale so the messages were stale, and just definitely were ignoring them. Um, now, Helling has, has made a description of the problem uh, on the mailing list. Um, and uh, what was very nice to see is that uh, former chair Justin Dean and former uh, uh, main contributor, or one of the main contributors to OSR V2, Christopher Bielov, who is uh, retired, uh, responded and uh, have this discussion. Uh, have, uh, have been discussing with uh, Henning what would be the best approach uh, to fix this. And as things stand now, and as far as I understand, there is a, uh, some idea to produce uh, an informational RFC with some guidance on how to avoid this problem. Um, and. The way it looks now, um, it will not be needed to actually uh, make modifications to the protocol. But uh, as I said, the discussion is ongoing. And I, uh, I'm planning to uh, dive, dive deeper into this so that I also understand exactly what's going on. But uh, at the moment, it's between uh, Henning and Christopher mostly. And I'm trying to, uh, to understand what they're saying. Um, but uh, I think it would be great uh, because Christopher even uh, offered uh, to help with, uh, with uh, drafting such a, such a, a document. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, be very good. I hope that answers the question. I don't know who the question was coming from, actually. It was me, Ronald. And yes, thank oh. you. That I was just just asking as a point of order, but that's great. You've covered it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, where do we stand with multicast? Uh, previously, a uh, long time ago. Um, uh, simplified multicast forwarding was uh, was done as an experimental RFC. Uh, as map is not even a real protocol. Uh, it describes uh, some ways to do uh, smart floating uh, by doing duplicate packet detection. It, pr it specifies several techniques for doing duplicate packet detection, and then in the appendices. It has uh, several examples of techniques for uh, relay set reduction, so that not every uh, node uh, uh, in, the, in your uh, Manet environment is resubmitting, retransmitting uh, uh, packets to flood them to everyone, but uh, just uh, a selected few. And then you can, you can use the information from your unicast uh, routing protocol uh, the, the NPRs 
from OSR uh, V2, for example, to uh, reduce uh, that rig. I'm, I, was, I, I was just joining the queue till the end of this slide because I'm going oh, to okay. yeah. so I'll, okay. I'll Now, uh, as I said, after the recharger in uh, 2016, um, Justin Dean gave an uh, uh, a presentation at the Berlin uh, ITF, ITF 96, uh, outlining his ideas for what what to do on multicast, and I have uh, I have uploaded that presentation again as part of the uh, meeting materials for this meeting, and I will briefly go over it. Uh, I got this uh, approval to do that, uh, and part of that is also uh, an even older uh, uh, document on elastic. Elastic Multicast Routing Protocol uh, that was written and presented uh, in, in the last meeting of 2013 by Brian Adamson, uh, a colleague of uh, Justin. And uh, that um, says that you can do more intelligent uh, things than uh, smart flooding, uh, building an actual multicast tree, uh, as long as certain sections of your uh, network are relatively stable and the idea was never picked up by by the working group but uh, I know that uh, NRL has been progressing this internally and in fact if you look at uh, NRL SMF their implementation on GitHub then you see that there's uh, quite a bit of support code for that uh, already. Another uh, Oddball, I would almost say, is the on-demand multicast routing protocol, which is very old. It says it's origins in 2002, I think, but was uh, at some point revived uh, in 2014, and then uh, those people went away again. But uh, last year, uh, I suddenly heard this mentioned again by uh, a colleague of Henning. So maybe uh, there's some interest there to pick that up. And, the interesting thing about uh, on-demand uh, multicast routing protocol is that it actually takes uh, group membership into account, which SMF does not. Then, uh, Rick, you mentioned beer uh, already several times, and I still haven't been able to uh, uh, wrap my head around that and, and uh, determine whether that's actually a viable technology in a, in a money, but I will. Just commenting on, on, on the beer comment, Rick Taylor here. Um, the reason I raised beer is beer is a technique that has very much developed since we've been talking about multicast in Manet's. So uh, you, uh, you've got comments on here looking back at things from 2013 and earlier. Um, beer has arrived since then, and I wonder whether there hasn't been people looking at it. I wonder whether you could flood beer membership and then build your trees on top of it or, or, or something. I, I, I haven't got the cycles to look at it. It was just, that was why I raised the comment on beer. Um, personally, I, I will try to uh, free up some cycles to look at it because uh, it's interesting to me. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, there's a reason why, uh, why multicast is different. Uh, different and difficult in, uh, in uh, mobile ad hoc networks. Uh, PIM sparse mode does not uh, work, uh, we know. So, so can, I, can I add my comment now at the end of this slide? Of course. Um, I'm going to be contentious and sure. say that I think multicast in mayonnaise is being addressed at the link layer. From everything I'm seeing happening in the industry, um the radio vendors because they can do clever things at the radio layer with overhearing and they have more immediate understanding about, about which terminals are online and, and what's happening at the rf layer they're tackling it and i'm seeing radios now ip radios appearing on the market saying yes we just do multicast mm. 
as a router, give me your multicast traffic and we'll sort it for you. And so I'm wondering whether this work actually still has a home in the IETF or whether it's it's being done in academia and being handled in 802.11 or, or 802.15 or in, in various non IEEE environments. And, and and the link layer community will will solve this for their own specific types of link layer. Uh, that's, you could be right there. On the other hand, that only works if uh, everybody is using the same link layer. And in a heterogeneous environment, uh, you may still want to uh, do something different. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. But I think you would then be bridging multicast capable or, or joining multicast capable subnets together at layer right. three, where right. something like source specific um, peer, some PIM variation or perhaps going back to my previous point beer some existing multicast technology at layer three will handle it uh, it's but, an interesting piece I, I don't know but, but that's but that's fine um... But what we then need is a, a small group of people, uh, uh, preferably larger than one. Uh, yes. Which takes uh, takes a look at that. And if uh, none of the four uh, uh, bullet points that I listed first are, are of interest anymore, but there is uh, some way to uh, to do this uh, bridging, as you call it, that's fine too. That could be a subject too. Uh, Lou? I'm going to uh, uh, maybe disagree with uh, Rick. Good. So I talked to him uh, about maybe on the next slide or the next topic, bringing in um, what's happening in RAW, which Rick chairs. And I'll point out to Rick that there's discussion in RAW about a, um, uh, IP aware multicast. Uh, running integrated with the radios. So, you know, in that context, there's there's someone arguing against the point that you made. Okay, I'll respond. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I'm, I'm well aware that that's, that's happening in within the context of RAW, but I think that's happening in negotiation with the capabilities of the link layer. So, the link layer is solving the how is it happening and raw is using that capability in order to deliver determinism yeah i think that's not clear in the discussions in raw and no, the, it isn't, the I comment, agree. what's that i agree it's not clear yeah so i think the the comment which belongs on the next topic is there may be work coming in from raw or some protocol uh, work that's being defined in RAW, which is not currently chartered to do protocol work, that may end up here uh, at some point. But, you know, I, I, I think it's still sorting its way out there. Yeah, we're very much in that writing architecture documents. And I think most of the people I can see on the attendees list here were actually in RAW as well, which was great. But, um, yeah, uh, so, so RAW is very much doing the, 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 thing, the use cases, the architecture, the, the technologies piece and it would be great to bring some of the protocol development into Manet because Manet has the wealth of experience with doing it but there's still big open questions about multicast but I'll, I'll cede my place in the line yeah and I just uh, noticed the comment by Alvaro in the main list in the chat right moving on um, just to finish this uh, slide set. Um, we, uh, we have this, uh, this work item about, uh, as I said, uh, outlining challenges and best practices for deploying and managing networks. Uh, well, I brought this up before, but uh, we can uh, silently ignore it or, or remove it altogether, but, but I don't think that... Uh, but please contradict me if I got it wrong, but uh, I don't think that, uh, that anybody will come forward and say, yes, this is how you should, uh, should uh, deploy and manage your m and um, based on our experience, because uh, I think those who are running 
actual real life uh, manage uh, uh, will keep that knowledge to themselves. Alvaro. Hey, um, I guess I just want to say that I agree with you. Um, I, I think we ended up with this uh, item in the charter as some sort of compromise from earlier documents that didn't say how you would manage the network. Right, yes. we were finding, I don't know, LSR or whatever, and, and it wasn't clear how the network would be managed. Um, there was a draft that uh, I ended up killing because it was OSR specific, I think, on management. And what we wanted was a more general one. Um, I, I think that as we recharter, depending on what changes we put in the charter, maybe we can just silently ignore and no one will notice. Um, yeah, but yeah. You know, we may still run the risk that we want to, that someone wants to put something in here and we'll have to explain to them um, you know, why normal or traditional um, management is not gonna work in a minute, right? The topologies and state oh. especially. And, and so the same goes for like Yang models and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I've been thinking about, um, and, and Rick knows this, um, in uh, the DTM working group, there's a thing called uh, asynchronous management architecture. And that's for DTM. But I think a lot, a lot uh, as far as I understand it, uh, a large part of it would also be applicable to, uh, to Monet's. Uh, but uh, I'll first uh, give uh, Ronnie Bull uh, the microphone and uh, a chance to react. Ronnie, go ahead. I just wanted to say, it's from what I've seen, it's it's too diverse of a problem to really put a uh, you know, set of standards or best practices to. You have many different protocols people may be using, so it's really a challenging problem to do in this in this environment. So I think you know I agree with what's being said. I'll defer to Rick now. Right. Um, so I was going to pretty much underline what you just said, Ronald. I think the asynchronous management uh, protocol stack that's being developed in DTN may well cover the MANA management use cases, which can't be covered by traditional networking that's ha handled in the in the normal ops area of the IETF. So I think you're right, Alvaro, that, that the MANA straddles the point where your traditional management no longer functions. But I think at that point, DTN have a, a fairly mature, uh, mature is the wrong word, a fairly good idea of how to manage this that, that is being standardized. And we're very happy to share the work, you know. Um, we, we've got enough work in DTN. Uh, actually, we spent two years trying to find another home for this work. But um, it's stuck in DTN at the moment. The official oh. stuff, or is it um, stuck with because you didn't find a home? It, it, so, so yeah, I remember a while ago we we're talking with Spencer and, and, and you and someone else about maybe moving that work to Manet. Yeah. So exactly. is, DTN, is DTN charter for that, or is it just That's, there because there's no other place? So we we went round on it about four times and came to the conclusion that because DTN is a bit of a microcosm of its of its own making. So although it's in transport, the nature of the deeply delayed and disrupted networks we're we're building solutions for, the management sort of lives with it. And there's the open question on routing, but the management is now in our rechartering text that is uh it's now sat with the ad so i think we've got it now and we're happy to do it and that's that's has the consensus of the working group that they wish to work on it within dtn um okay. and without being rude to this community i think we have more participants in the dtn working group than we do in man so i'm i'm happy and there's a lot of crossover so i'm i'm happy it's getting the eyes it needs and i think that's the most important thing really 
Yeah, and with the main driving force between the Async Image Management architecture and now being a DTN chair, uh, I think it will be taken good care of. It, it helps, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, and the young models was, was something that came up in my preparation call with, uh, with Don. Um, because um, Young uh, was not so popular uh, at the time that, uh, for instance, Olador V2 was done, was done. So there are mix, but uh, but no Yang models. But maybe there shouldn't be. I don't know. I hear what you were just saying. Okay. Um, I was going to go over the old uh, presentation of Justin, but I see that we are almost out of time. So I'm going to skip. Um, to this slide again, and then uh, discuss the last bullet. I gave a presentation uh, back in Montreal um, two years ago over uh, um, the need uh, to connect um, different money enclaves, so to speak. And um, there, the point that Rick just made is very valid. Um, there may be several um, proprietary uh, money solutions uh, doing multicast and probably also unicast at, uh, at layer two, but somehow you need to connect these together. And uh, that's also uh, that something that we can work on. And so some people have different uh, different ideas about this. Uh, Henning, for instance, thinks that we can perfectly do this with OSR version 2. Uh, and I've been uh, dabbling with my own protocol. But, uh, uh, but we have three minutes left, I see. So uh, let's not go into that now unless uh, some people have some comments. Uh, I know that uh, in the past, uh, Ronnie Bull uh, expressed interest and I never got uh, back to him uh, on that. Uh, so my apologies for that, uh, Ronnie. So, um, So, uh, for multicast, uh, and I'll bring this up on the list, but I really would like to uh, to see if uh, we can have a small group uh, to explore what is possible. Um, and maybe uh, uh, do even an interim on that, if we, if we get anywhere. Um, and if not, then, uh, then maybe one of the other uh, subjects or items of this list. Um, I certainly hope that uh, the OSR version 2 maintenance work um, will get off the ground. Uh, and we do this informational RFC. And I'm willing to help with that myself as soon as I understand the, uh, the issue. And with that, uh, I think we're uh, we're almost out of time. So, uh, thanks for your attention, for your presentations, for your questions, and uh, probably see you uh, online some other time, and maybe in the further future uh, in real life. I hope. So thanks. Just checking the uh, the chat window to see if there was anything else. Thanks very much, Chaz. Hi, today. Since you asked, is there anything else in there that I put in the updated document?
that Ronald mentioned, uh, I found his review and posted the update. Uh, uh, I also did the zero zero document for your approval whenever you're ready. Yep. Which basically basically equals exactly the last the, the last version of the the one I just uploaded. So uh, over here it's uh, two thirty in the morning. So uh, do you mind if I defer this to, to uh, <laughs> the other side of a couple of hours of sleep? Or, so, or <laughs> absolutely. You thank you for thank you for everything. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay, bye. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye bye. And thanks, Tom. I tried to take some notes, so we'll see how they, how they go. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Good. Lou helped. I did not even open the uh, Gumby and the window.